There we go. Uh, again, once again, welcome everyone to the lab webinar for August 20th. We have an exciting, wonderful webinar coming up. But before we get there, I want to thank everyone for supporting uh, Los Angeles birders and Los Angeles birder students. Your support, which isn't really intense, it's real easy. Uh, your support helps to put on webinars like this, to record those webinars and make them available for the entire birding community. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of hits uh, on webinars we've done over the past four years. And uh, we appreciate and thank all of you who support Los Angeles Birders. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Charlie to introduce our speaker for tonight. Charlie? Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Dr. Doug Robinson with us tonight. Dr. Robinson is is an endowed professor of wildlife science and curator of birds at Oregon State University. Doug studies avian ecology and conservation. He focuses on tropical community ecology, uh, influences of environmental change on birds and their life histories, and legacy science via collaborations with citizen scientists. Doug says that birds are his expertise, his vocation, and his avocation. He studies wild birds to understand how and why they respond to environmental change, as well as, well as why they live their lives in the way that they do. Doug's, Doug also values the skills of both professional and amateur birders alike. Doug believes that birders can make great contributions to the knowledge of birds and the environment while still enjoying uh, birds as a hobby. Doug volunteers as an eBird reviewer, shares his bird data with eBird, and encourages others to archive their data as well. Tonight, Doug will talk about the biology behind the dramatic plumage changes of ducks and give us some tips on identification of a few of the brown ducks we can use as exemplars for getting the names right on all the other ducks too. So get ready for an hour of fun and enlightenment sorting out these confusing brown summer ducks. Please welcome Dr. Doug, Doug Robinson. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Great. Good job. So let's see if this is going to work the way we thought it was going to work. <laughs> looks great looks great okay perfect let me move a couple things around so i can see okay we actually, we, i'm good? sorry we actually have along the left border uh it looks like your screen or my part screen. of it oh my dock maybe yeah oh there you go there we go, there we go. Okay. Better. Okay, there you go. now you got a full screen nothing in the way correct yes, that's right okay fantastic Good. All right. Well, let's talk about all those nasty summer ducks that are brown and hard to identify. Um, it's one of the one of the great challenges that we have as birders. But I think that you'll see as we go through a few tips um, after I explain a little bit about the biology um, that most of the identifications are reasonably straightforward. And so you just have to know where to send your eye to look at a duck to figure out how to put the right name on it. So. Since you're in California, it reminded me of the song California Dreamin', and I took the liberty to modify the uh, lyrics a little bit. You might remember that the original song is uh, all the leaves are brown, but we're going to be talking about all the ducks are brown and the goals are gray. What's a birder to do on a summer's day? So famous old song by the mamas and the papas. If, if you can sing, then you can sing along with the new lyrics, but I... I am sure you will disengage quickly if I try to sing that song. <laughs> so it's not that birds are brown, right, that turn us off, because a lot of our really exciting, fun birds are brown. Like if a Swainson's warbler showed up anywhere on the West Coast, we'd all be thrilled with that. That's a pretty darn brown bird. Some of our favorite birds are owls. They're pretty much all brown. You can get into sparrows down in the right-hand corner and sort through them. They're brown. They can be fun. There's all kinds of brown birds out there that are a blast to look at. But for some reason, ducks kind of, uh, you know, we see a big pile of brown ducks and we turn away. On the other hand, if we run into a big flock of brown and gray shorebirds somewhere, we'll get all excited and think, oh my gosh, there must be something fun and thrilling in there. And so we'll sort through all those. 
forever on ends, looking at every single little brown shorebird, trying to figure out if there's some extra fun, super cool brown shorebird hiding in that giant flock. So we definitely have, on average, I would say a tendency to focus more on getting exciting, excited about certain kinds of brown birds and maybe a little bit less excited about other kinds. And unfortunately, sometimes ducks fall into that. I'm not so excited about them, uh, that side of the, of the groups. And there's some good reasons, right? If you look at ducks, we're like, well, we know immediately that it's a duck, but the differences are pretty subtle. And there are other times of year when it's a lot easier to figure out what they are. And so we might say, I'll wait and take a, take a stab at putting the right name on them at a time of year when it's a lot easier. So lots of very similar looking brown ducks, but we all know a duck when we see it. So we want to talk about these ducks, though. That's the point of the, the seminar today is to see what we can learn. And so this is the slide that's going to have the most words on it out of the whole uh, the whole uh, webinar. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I hit a few reasons that ducks are fun to study and ducks are actually pretty um, interesting in the sense that uh, there's so much known about them that when you look at a duck and you start to figure out how to put the right name on it when you see it, you can also start to appreciate that um, they're really special birds. For one thing, they're one of the best known groups of birds in the world, and that is due in no small part to the fact that we have eaten them for millennia. And so we know a ton about their biology. We know how to raise them. They've been the subject of study of uh, avian physiology. We know a lot about their diseases that they get exposed to and how it affects their populations. They're big, so we can put tracking devices on them far more easily than shorebirds or songbirds. And so we know a lot about where they go and spend their year. We know a ton about um, their population sizes. In fact, we probably have, aside from a very few examples, such as some endangered species, where we know down to more or less the exact number of, for example, how many condors or whooping cranes there are, we have a really good accurate idea of population sizes of most kinds of waterfowl in North America. Um, and that's because we want to manage their populations and not over harvest them. There are many millions of birds of ducks and geese harvested in North America every year. And so the smart way to maintain that is to invest a lot in monitoring their population sizes so that we can run pretty sophisticated population models and understand how many we can take without negatively affecting the populations too much. So there are literally thousands or tens of thousands of miles of aerial transects that get flown every year across the breeding ranges of ducks in North America, um, and lots and lots of on-the-ground surveys, and extensive efforts by what we call wing bees, where hunters um, turn in one of the wings of a bird that they harvest so that we can look at age ratios of the birds being uh, harvested by hunters and, and feed all those data into models and predict what their population sizes are going to be next year so that we can regulate bag limits and those sorts of things. On the broader scale, um, they also affect the conservation of an enormous number of other birds, especially any bird that likes uh, wetlands. So shorebirds and marsh birds um, are dramatically aided um, by conservation efforts that are invested in ducks. And so you can think of groups like Ducks Unlimited, um, NRCS, the Soil and Conservation Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife, all kinds of agencies spend a lot of time acquiring land, managing lands to make sure that there's plenty of wetland habitat for ducks. And that, of course, benefits a ton of other birds. Lots of habitat preservation um, has ancillary effects that uh, people who like songbirds, like me, enjoy because those places also have all kinds of other wildlife. Um, something people don't appreciate, uh, if you've ever taught a bird ID class, you will appreciate th this fact, and that's that uh, new birders like ducks. They like ducks because if you're out, especially in the winter when they're in their fancy plumages, 
Uh, they're pretty distinctive and easy to identify. They sit right out in the open most of the time. And um, they're pretty much everywhere you can find a wetland. And so that means if you're a new birder and you're trying to learn how to identify birds, you have some hope that you're going to have a good positive experience. Try taking a new birder out in a giant field and asking them to stomp around and kick up brown sparrows and see if they ever come back. Very few people will do that. But if you give them an experience where they see giant flocks of beautiful ducks, they might get hooked on, on appreciating the birds. And then finally, they don't all quack. So there were lots of duck jokes being quacked in the beginning of this webinar. Um, but it turns out that one of the best ways to make sure you got your identification correct when you're looking at a brown duck and you're looking at little subtle habit or habitat, little subtle uh, features on the plumages of birds is to listen because they have very distinctively different sounds. And, and I'll remind you about a place where you can go listen to those sounds online and, and uh, refresh your memory, but it's, it's a, an excellent way to double check your ID based on visual information. Um, some whistle, some grunt, some quack, um, different kinds of quacks, males and females have different sounds even within the same species. So it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty good tool. All right, so that's the the high level overview of why we should talk about ducks. Okay, now you would think identifying ducks would be super easy, especially if you had males in these kinds of plumages, right? What what bird can you think of that is that much more beautiful than a male pintail, which is the the big image right there in the middle? That's a pretty spectacular looking duck. And in the bottom middle, you've got maybe one of the most underappreciated spectacular ducks because it's so widespread and common. And that's our male mallard, right? The bright green head, solid chestnut uh, breast, white ring around the neck and a bright yellow bill. I mean, that's a, that's a good looking bird right there. And then of course, shoveler in the upper right, green wing teal in the middle right, widgeon in the lower right and blue wing teal in the lower left. Those are some fine looking birds right there. So you can see why, for example, new birders would be like, wow, this birding thing is cool. Look at those amazing birds. But then those amazing male ducks <laughs> have mates that like to hide and protect themselves. And it turns out that that strategy of being able to be brown and blend into the background uh, is a good strategy for those bright male ducks at certain times of year too. And so they switch their plumages to look a lot like the females. There's some subtle differences between the brown plumage of males and the brown plumage of females. I won't get into the weeds on all of that this evening, um, but know that there are quite a few differences. And if you become a, a duck aficionado, you can work through all those details. Tonight, I'm just gonna hit the highlights on, I think it's eight, different dabbling duck species to, to help you train your eye to, to know where to look to get the right name on them. So the first thing we need to know about why male ducks in particular get brown and hard to identify, and that's kind of going to be the focus this evening is um, identifying those those male ducks. Because like if you go out to your favorite, your favorite wetland right now and you scan across um, some pile of ducks that's out there, you're pretty much only going to see brown ones. There's not going to be any of the nice looking pintails or the nice looking mallards just yet. I mean, just starting to, to, to get there. So um, what we're going to try to work around at a kind of a high level here is what's happening and why are they all brown this time of the year? And I felt like it might be helpful to give a little context because um, it's really just a simple shift in timing that leads to uh, those male ducks being uh, brown in the summertime. Uh, uh, most of the birds where we see a change in their plumage coloration happen across the years um, have a schedule that is exhibited by uh, this phalarope as an example. You know, for most of birds' lives, their main goal is to survive and to get to the point in the year where they have a chance to reproduce and then keep surviving. And so the best strategy to survive is exhibited by the bird on the left, which is the fowl rope. 
um, in the winter when it's not breeding and camouflage and being dull colored is much better. Um, you just have a higher chance of not being detected by predators if you can blend into your background a little bit better. But it turns out that birds, when they're looking for a mate, tend to want to look for a snazzier plumage. And so the birds that look better have a higher chance of grabbing a mate. And of course, if you know the biology of phalaropes, this has switched a little because uh, the female is the bright uh, colored bird in phalarope land. Um, and so anyway, if she wants to get a mate, she's the evolution has has directed phalarope plumage to become much more brightly colored in the spring and summer to attract the attention of males. And so she um, basically looks snazzy and and breeding time wants to stand out and wants to grab attention and wants to attract mates. That's the better strategy. And then once that period of the year is over, we go back to, I need to just survive and I need to, to make it on to the next opportunity. And so after breeding is over in the fall, the birds molt back into the duller plumage. And so that's fairly typical for most birds. Of course, most birds, it's the male that's um, molting into the, the snazzy plumage um, at the time when uh, the bird's going to be trying to attract a mate and then eventually breed. So that's kind of the standard operating plan there for ducks um they're big and they're out in open habitats for the most most part um but when they breed uh or if they're at some other point in their life cycle where they're potentially at a disadvantage which i'll, I'll talk to you about a specific one here in a minute it makes a lot more sense to be brown and and blend into the, the background and so ducks do what that fallow rope does but a little bit differently on a little bit different schedule so and basically it's all driven by when they choose mates and when they set up their pair bonds and so in most ducks and most geese um, there's always exceptions but in most cases um, their pair bonding schedule just happens earlier and so um, they do most of their pair bonding in the late fall and the winter and so to be ready for that to be attractive to mates, they need to be in their best plumage. They need to be in the snazzy stage in the fall and the winter, not in the spring and the summer. And so males, because they don't give a ton of parental care after they share their magnificently valuable sperm with the females, um, they're done. And so what they do is then they shift to that alternative strategy where it's like, if I'm not actively trying to attract a mate, then my best strategy is to get into camouflage um, they and then after that's over and it's time again in the fall for them to find a mate they'll they'll their hormones will kick in and they'll grow a plumage that is brightly colored the other wrinkle that i alluded to earlier about ducks that's interesting is that um, because they're big because they have options to uh, spend the time when they're not engaged in looking for mates in habitats that are rich in resources, the best strategy seems to work. The best strategy for them for their molt of their flight feathers seems to be to drop them all at the same time, which means they're flightless for on average, probably three to five weeks. And, um, you probably remember that, and you can see this all the time when you see birds flying over this time of the year, like uh, crows or ravens or raptors. You see when birds molt their flight feathers, most birds molt one or two, sometimes three at a time or in different stages of growth. And you'll see, you know, the same feather missing on each wing, but that bird's still flying. Ducks drop them all. And so talk about a time when you want to be inconspicuous. If you can't fly and escape predators, then one, you want to be hanging out in a place where uh, you have plenty of food because you can't move from food patch to food patch very well. You got to swim or walk. Um, and two, you need to be able to not catch the eye of a predator if you can get away with it. And so ducks have that interesting shift in their calendar and an additional reason for, for hiding. So they make a they make a really radical shift and they look a lot like females. But as we go through here, we'll point out a, a few differences um, 
between the male and the female plumage. So when males go into their summer plumage, you can still tell they're males. You just have to know what the characteristics are at that time of the year. So on this mallard, for example, you can still see kind of a pale yellowish bill. It's less yellow and more green um, in the summer, but it's still a distinctive characteristic of the bird. I'll show you that more in here in a minute. Okay, so maybe reiterating a couple points and, and um, bringing up a few other things and showing you a picture of one of these summertime mallards. If you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, probably not, but if you look at the wing on this bird, so this is a bird facing away from us. So the breast is up to the left and the tail, of course, to the right. You can see those feathers are all about the same length, but they're really short. And so all those feathers were dropped more or less at the same time, those primary and secondary feathers. Um, and they've all been regrowing at about the same pace. And so that tells you because they're all short and uh, all about the same length that they were all dropped at the same time. Great. But and so, yes, we can see your cursor. You can see it? Yes. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that really helps. So you're looking at this part of the wing right here. Here's the primaries and then the secondaries up here. And so these, uh, it, it's really an interesting strategy because not very many birds, there are some others, but not very many uh, drop all their flight feathers at the same time. Uh, one of the ideas for this is, uh, I, I could share an anecdote that really drove drove home why this happens uh, to me is that if you, if you are a bird that has a normal molting schedule and you drop one, two or three um, flight feathers at a time, um, you can still fly, but your speed's not going to be super great. But um, most birds um, are much smaller relative to their wing sizes, smaller being uh, lighter than ducks are. Ducks are pretty heavy. And so if they drop one, two, or three primaries at a time and take two, three months to change all their feathers rather than a few weeks, um, they are very susceptible to predators. And my anecdote is that one time I was out counting ducks um, at my local um, sewage lagoons and I saw a greater white-fronted goose haul and butt as hard as it could, come, came over the tree line, um, flew over me, headed out over the ponds. And I was like, wow, that's the fastest I've ever seen a white-fronted goose fly in my life. And about three seconds later, a bald eagle came behind. And they lapped the ponds like four times and they were both flying as hard as they could. This was in the fall. So the goose had all of its, its flight feathers and the goose was not gaining an inch and the bald eagle was not losing an inch. And I was like, this is exactly why evolution allows greater white fronted geese to fly that speed. <laughs> and so if it had not had all of its primaries. If it was molting, it would have been a dead goose because that bald eagle would have caught it. Just that little bit of loss of of lift and um, forward drive from the wings would have really, it would have cost it its life. So anyway, um, again, ducks have this strategy because they can go to a safe foraging area that's that's got a, a lot of food. Um, they move into that female-like brown plumage, which is technically called the eclipse phase or the eclipse plumage that they're in. Um, and since they can't fly for a few weeks, they're basically stuck wherever they're at. Um, again, unless they can walk or swim somewhere else. And then when they get their wings back, then they start the process of molting their body feathers into those bright colors because by then it's the end of summer and going into fall and they're um, about to get into the phase of the year where they're looking for a new mate. So uh, let me move this out of the way for me so I can see this a little bit better. Um, interestingly, females also have an eclipse plumage and it's very um, underappreciated and probably doesn't matter to most of us because the differences are really subtle between the the um, plumage that they have as they enter um, into the breeding season um, and when they're done. But on average, when they're going to be nesting, they go into a plumage that has more of a disrupted barred pattern on their feathers so that they can blend into the habitat background when they're on, on the nest. 
a little bit better. And when they get done nesting, um, they molt back into a little bit brighter, snazzier um, looking brown plumage themselves. Um, they tend to to drop their primaries at a different time than the males do um, because um, their timing is largely tied to when their young become independent. And so the males do it when the females have a clutch uh, that's complete and, th and they don't have a chance to mate with any other females. So basically most of the females in the population that they're they're courting have clutches, then the males drop their their light feathers and start molting and uh, the female ducks wait until they're young or are pretty much independent. And then they go through a very similar process. So, okay. All right. So this is a slide to remind me that um, I'm just going to tell you some of the details about uh, about eight of the, the dabbling ducks. Diving ducks have a similar process that they go through, but instead of the males turning brown and looking a lot like females, all they do is, is basically uh, exhibit a plumage that's more, uh, more of a muted version of their normal um, plumage that you would see in late winter or uh, late fall and early winter. They still have the same uh, courting schedule for the most part. Ruddy duck is an interesting example. Um, they they are a bit different from everybody else, but most of the diving ducks just look like the plumages you'd be used to seeing in the sort of the, the bright snazzy uh, phase of, of their plumage. And so, for example, on the lesser scop on the left, you still see the purpley sheened head and the bright yellow eye, the black chest mottled back and the white wing stripe. But it's just kind of it's not as sharp looking as it as it is in the fall and the winter and ring neck duck. Same thing that white dagger mark that's so characteristic of ring neck ducks up just to the left of the chest here um, is just gray, but it's still there. You can see the the shadow of it. And um, otherwise it, it looks like that. So I won't talk too much about the diving ducks because um, yeah, there you can identify those, the males in eclipse plumage pretty easily. So your best clue on ducks is to get a look at the secondaries. Right, the secondaries are are diagnostic marks. Each species has a, a different pattern. I'll show you some where the pattern differences are pretty subtle, and so you don't always want to rely on them. Uh, but for the most part, if you can look at those beautiful wing feathers, that's where your eye should go first or second when you're trying to identify a, a brown duck. So just spectacular um, colors on on some of these wings. So just to quickly remind everybody, if you're looking at an outstretched wing, those outermost feathers that are primarily responsible for driving birds forward when they're they're flapping, that's where they get all the thrust, are the primaries. The inner ones that are essentially doing most of the lifting part um, are the secondaries. And in ducks, when those feathers are brightly colored, we often refer to those as the speculum. And so this bright iridescent coloration um, and enhanced colors around it lead us to, to call that a speculum. And you can kind of think of these in a way as like Olympic flags. They're specific to each nation and they're generally pretty different from one another. Um, there's some interesting like subtle differences like, what is it, France that's blue, red, white, blue band, and Russia is blue, white, red, or something like that. So there, there's some subtle things to keep straight. Uh, but for the most part, if you get a look at that, this is your, your best clinching field mark on most ducks. So let's start with mallard, which is the one we were just looking at. And mallards are pretty easy because they're, at least on the West Coast, um, they're the only ones that have that bright blue um, in the middle there um, on the secondary patch and the speculum. And then they have this really beautiful uh, white black row on the coverts at the leading edge up here at the top. Those are the greater secondary coverts. And then the secondary feathers are blue, kind of like a blue jay, eastern blue jay with black and white tip. And so if you see that blue white pattern, you've got yourself a mallard. There's nothing else on the west coast that looks like that. And on the East Coast, there's some variation in that pattern, mostly the loss of the white, um, but mottled duck and black duck have a similar pattern, but I would say that they're more purpley than, 
than blue in the in the bright um, coloration on there. But anyway, for us, mallards, diagnostic. If you see that, it doesn't matter if it's a brown duck or a green-headed yellow-billed uh, mallard um, in its winter plumage, you've got yourself a mallard. So that's always a, a good place to, to guide your eye. Then we've got a couple of species that have bright white patches on the wings. Um, gadwall has this inner set of primaries that are white and then black, and it's got this beautiful chestnut um, up at the um, front part, but basically those are called the uh, marginal coverts, but that doesn't really matter. Just gadwall has chestnut black and white, and it's really this white inner part of the secondary patch that I would like to remind you to, to try to focus on seeing. So gadwalls have white at the trailing edge on their wings and American widgeons have white on the leading edge, close to the leading edge of their wing, but really the secondaries are black. And so if a widgeon happens to spread its entire wing out, um, you got a brown widgeon sitting, brown bird, brown duck, you think might be a widgeon sitting somewhere and it spreads the whole wing out and you see that white up at the leading edge, you know for sure it's a widgeon, but mostly you're just gonna see black on the, the secondaries and so, um, some ducks, when they're sitting on the water, will give you a little peek, a little window at part of the, the speculum, part of the secondaries, but not all will. And even if a widgeon did, it probably wouldn't catch your eye because they're all black. But in flight, really easy to tell the two apart. Widgeons have white up front and gadwall have the white at the trailing edge. Then we got a couple that look remarkably similar. Um, pintail and green wing teal, but they're very different in size. So I don't think you'll ever um, mistake these two. Um, well, I'll show you some more um, tips on looking at size and shape and uh, it'll really drive home that I don't think you'll ever make a mistake on pintails and green wing teals. But technically speaking, if you look at the, se the, the secondary patches, you've got white trailing edge on the pintail here, some, some black with beautiful green, and then this bronze row of feathers at the tips of the greater coverts. Um, and then you look over at green wing teal, pretty much same thing, white with some black and green, and then more white, less brown. This is gonna vary with the age of the bird um, at, with respect to how much white there is here and how many of these feathers are brownish. Um, but overall, it's the same, same general pattern. One thing I do notice uh, when I see these in the field is that Green wing teal, when you can see that uh, green patch is a lot more emerald green and uh, pintails are more bronzy green. So there'll be a lot more brown kind of cast into this reflective green that pintails have. But again, big size difference in the bodies, big difference in the plumage patterns. And so uh, this will help you confirm if you've got like, for example, a green wing teal versus a blue wing or cinnamon or something like that that looks somewhat similar but you're not going to mess up a a pintail they just are so diagnostically different from everyone else and everything else about them but uh, not a lot of people know that the secondary patches on those two species are pretty similar in in sort of configuration and coloration okay here's where it's not going to be too terribly helpful except to get you down to three possibilities these are what i call the powder blues um, and the, the patch uh, pattern is very similar. So you got shoveler over here on the left, cinnamon teal and blue wing teal, and they all have pale blue feathers on the uh, marginal coverts and the lesser coverts up here at the leading edge of the wing. So all three have these pale blue patches. And then that's um, followed by uh, white tips to the greater coverts, the greater secondary coverts on all three of them. And then you've got some metallic green with black tips on the secondaries themselves. And so this is pretty similar looking. And if you get, if you're doing like a, a project where you get to handle those duck wings, where I was talking about with the, they do the, the wing bees to take the hunted, uh, the duck wings from hunters so that they can establish age ratios. And there are certain things that you can look at. There are subtle features on these wings that'll give you a lot of information, but overall, all you'll see on a sitting brown duck with these is there's some green in the in the secondaries. And so it won't help you too terribly much. So it's better to look at other features 
on these three. I will point out something fun though, if these birds stretch their wings out and you're wondering about them and you can see the the primaries when a bird stretches its wings out, if you've determined it's one of these powder blues, the shaft on shoveler uh, primaries is pretty bright white and on the other ones it's gray and that really stands out in the field and it's a little s subtly different on the picture I've got here uh, but it's very obvious on birds stretching their wings out in the field all right so those are the powder blues two teals and a shoveler okay the trouble with the speculum, with the secondary patch, is that a lot of times you can't see the darn thing. <laughs> and you may think, okay, I'm going to be a very patient human being, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to wait for this duck to rise up and flap its wings or stretch or something. That's the time when they won't do it for a half an hour. And you'll be like, okay, I'm not as, as zen as I thought I was. I got to go. I'm tired of looking at this brown duck. So it really helps if you have other features that you can key in on. And surprisingly enough, one of the best is just what's the general shape of the bird. Um, so on the upper right here, we've got the one example of what I call the tall and elegant shape. And this is a pintail. And pintails have this nice, long, slender, uh, sinuous, uh, curved neck and just really beautiful proportions. Um, and so it's kind of swan-like in a way. Um, none of the other ducks have that long, narrow, uh, slopey neck. So should be a, a bird that jumps right out at you immediately based on its shape. Um, then we'll go down to the typical group. This is what I call the upright typical ducks. Basically, any bird that looks like it's shaped like a mallard. It's got a regular duck bill. It's kind of got a long neck, but not a super long neck like a pintail. It's just got the regular old expected duck body shape. This is basically for the birds we'll talk about today, mallards, gadwalls, and, and widgeons. They basically have the typical shape. And so um, that'll at least eliminate a few of the other possibilities. There's the low rider group. These are the powder blues. So um, shovelers and the blue winged and cinnamon teal tend to have uh, profiles where they have a long body that rides low in the water, relatively short neck, and a pretty long bill, uh, especially in the shoveler. Uh, so I call those the low riders. And then you got the one little guy, the small small body and small bill, and that's the green wing teal. So they look like a little Nerf football or something. With a, it's got definitely a duck bill, but it's pretty small. It's not that impressive, and they're just cute and adorable, and it's pretty easy to figure out that you got a green wing teal based on on that um, although the plumage features can can throw you and this is technically if you're paying really close attention this is technically a, a common teal just a good picture that showed the bill size and the body shape so that's the the european asian version of our green wing teal okay so let's talk first about the typical ducks we like to talk about your standard things first um uh, mallards, pretty darn easy in the sense that they've got exactly the same shape that you expect in pretty much any typical duck. So big body, uh, moderate length to short length uh, neck, depending on their posture and what they're doing at the time. Um, nice, solid duck bill. It's not super long. It's not super short. It's not super spatula. It's just your typical expected duck bill. On a male in eclipse plumage, this greenish bill is really key. It's green. Maybe sometimes there's a little smudge on the on the upper ridge, what we call the saddle of the bill, but a lot of times it's just green and it's kind of olive green, so not even a bright green. Um, another key underappreciated mark is the tail color on mallards. Their tail feathers, at least the outer edges of the tail feathers that you can see when you're just looking at a bird out in the field most of the time are white or whitish. That will distinguish them from uh, gadwalls that we're going to look at here in a minute. And then, of course, if you can see the, the wings stretched out and see the speculum, um, they've got the white-blue-white white pattern. So mallards aren't too tough. Males in eclipse plumage because that, that bill is unlike any other bill on any other brown duck. Okay. 
There is one little feature though that I wanted to point out, um, one resemblance, and that is on gadwalls, the males in eclipse plumage have a bill that looks a lot like a female mallard. And so if you can see this blue, white, blue speculum, it sure does help. But mallards, again, even females have that white tail. And so if you see a bill like this and you think, oh, wait a minute, is that a female mallard or is that a gadwall? What, what am I looking at here? Uh, check the tail color. And if it's white, you got yourself a mallard. And especially if you can see that speculum and it's uh, white, blue, white, then you've got a mallard for sure. Okay, so how about these gadwalls? Here you see on the gadwall, the orange bill with the black saddle just like a mallard. Um, if you study gadwalls a fair bit, you'll notice that their bills are not quite as long and not quite as bulky as the bill of a mallard. And so you can start to pick up a little bit on that as a clue as well. But generally speaking, they're gonna have a, a bill that looks like a female mallard. It's gonna be pretty bright orange. It's gonna have a black saddle. It's usually a little bit narrower black saddle, but it, there's a lot of variation in that. They have a really interesting head shape, which is also something that I think most birders are aware you need to be careful of because attitude, behavior, posture, whether the bird's wet or not, um, can affect the details of that shape. But on average, gadwalls have a much steeper forehead. Um, it's almost like if you know the difference in head shape between greater scop and lesser scop, they tend to be more towards the greater scalp side and that the forehead rises more steeply and the highest part of the, the head um, is right over the eye or, or just in front of the eye. So they have a really distinctive head shape. The best mark though, other than that brown tail that I was telling you about is that they often have that little white patch from their secondaries showing, not always, but way more often I find anyway in my experience than in other ducks. And if you can see that bright white patch, and you know it's a patch and it's not just part of a white line from a, a mallard, then you got yourself a gadwall. So um, it's probably out of the ducks that we're going to talk about tonight, female mallard versus gadwall, it's one of the more subtle differences. But they often fortunately show that white patch um, from the secondaries. And then brown tail orange bill with a little black saddle and steep forehead. So even though this bird's got its bill submerged, you can still see it's a gadwall because it's got obviously more than just one little white line as part of a speculum. That's obviously part of an entire white feather. So, and here you go with the, the brown tail. The undertail coverts are a little pale, so you have to make sure you're actually looking at the tail feathers themselves, but brown tails gadwall. Okay, the other upright typical duck that we'll spend just one slide on because uh, it's actually, I think, fairly distinctive um, is American Widgeon. And it's distinctive because it has, a, on average, a fairly blunt bill. It's usually gray with a black tip. Um, one of the ideas for why it might be a little shorter than some of the other ducks is that it has more of a lifestyle like a goose a lot of times. And so geese, of course, walk along in grassy areas and, and snip uh, grass and eat forbs and things like that. Widgeons spend a lot of time walking on dry land doing the same thing. And so if that helps you remember because they walk around and act like geese, that they've got a shorter bill like geese, um, then maybe that'll be useful to you. But this... Uh, plain face without much of a face pattern, um, except for the smudgy mascara around their eyes, so to speak, um, is a really good mark. They have very, very fine vermiculations on their head that don't lead to any kind of a um, eye stripe or cap or anything else like some of the other brown ducks have. I find that the most obvious important mark, though, that you see right away is that their flanks are all mottled and they're often quite reddish in color. So you add that to a plain face and then you can see the black on this particular bird, the black uh, secondary showing up right there. And then you add a little bit of a slightly pointed tail and you got yourself a widgeon. So um, a little tricky, but maybe not so tricky 
between the gray bill, the smudginess around the eye, lack of a strong face pattern and those reddish flanks, there's really nothing else that looks like a, a summertime widgeon. All right, here back to our tall, elegant one, which I also just point out uh, real quickly, reminders on it. It's just beautiful and elegant. It's got this beautiful slope up from the bill onto the head, nice, perfectly rounded head. It's kind of like the, uh, if you ever watch Star Trek Next Gen, and you know how when people got attracted to Captain Picard, he had this perfectly round, bald head, and people wanted to pet it. <laughs> That's what this kind of reminds me in a perverse way of that. Because it's just perfect. They're just they're just designed in such a beautiful, elegant way. Um, and of course, they've got the pointed tail, not like when they're in their beautiful plumage males uh, will have a nice long pin tail, right? They, but they still have a pointed a pointed back end. Um, it's just smooth bird, totally unmarked, brownish unmarked face, no smudgy mascara. Widgets have kind of a gray unmarked face. Browns, uh, pintails have brown unmarked face. So. Beautiful duck, even in the summertime. It's just a really classy looking, uh, elegant bird. Okay, and then we got our small guy. And we're saving the, the toughest ones for the end. We'll kick into the green wing teal here. Small and small build brown duck. Uh, these can be tricky for a lot of people um, because they do give you the sense that I think that bird's small, but I'm not sure what kind of a teal it might be. They, a lot of people have this feeling when they see it, but basically they're, they're so small that their bodies look a lot more rounded than in most other ducks. Um, the bill is relatively short compared to the length of the head. So, you know, just on this picture, you can see that it's a little less than the length of the head. Um, and so pretty small and dainty. It's not a robust bill like your your upright typical ducks like a mallard or gadwall or something like that. It's almost always all dark. Again, rare exceptions, but almost always all dark. That's a, a good clue because uh, we're going to show you that on some of the other teal types that look like this, that uh, there's some coloration on certain parts of the bills on those, but usually not on a green wing teal. They normally have a dark line that's really obvious that goes through the the eye and a dark cap, so the rest of the face is buffy. Many birds, but not all of them, have a hint of a double eye line. You can sort of see the shadow of it on this bird. So from a distance through a scope, especially, that can stand out as something, and none of the other teal will have that. So this double eye line is actually just a dark area over the ears or the auriculars on the duck. So it's not it's not technically an island, but it gives you the impression that there's two line, two dark lines on the face. That's uh, that's something in my experience only green winged teal will show. Overall, they're dark too, dark brown, so not light like a pintail or even a cinnamon teal is going to look uh, paler than these guys, so they can be pretty dark brown. The key mark is the undertail coverts being pale. I think you can see that even from a great distance, and I. I think the next slide, yeah, the next slide shows this even better. An eclipse male um, is going to have obviously a nice bright pale patch on the underside under the tail. So those feathers are really going to stand out, uh, especially in any kind of decent light where you get a good look. You're going to be like, okay, I got a bunch of little brown ducks over here. There's some sort of teal, and these all have uh, bright pale undertail coverts. And of course, if you can get the look at that emerald green uh, secondary patch, then you've got it nailed down as a green wing teal. But they're little bitty guys and they make little peepy -pee noises. Uh, they don't quack. So uh, that's always nice to, to hear that and get confirmation that way as well. All right, now we go to the low riders, which are the leading up to the trickiest pair. This one, hopefully will not be too hard for anybody because it looks a lot like a mallard, but that bill is pretty darn unmistakable. It's a uh, northern shoveler, and not only is it massively spatulated, so it really flares out near the tip, but it's also often, not always, but often got a lot of orange around the, the cutting edge. This is called the, the tomium. Um, and it's got these lamellae 
that if you're close enough to the bird are really interesting to look at, um, really fine um, pieces of the bill that extend down and, and they basically force water to flow through that and filter out small food items. And so there's this gap. It's, if you think of it in some ways, analogous a little bit to what we call the grinning patch on snow geese, it's basically where the lower mandible and the upper mandible part, you get a little bit of a gap there with some other structures. But uh, shovelers are low riders. They've got that big spatulate bill. I will say you can often get a clue that you might be looking at shovelers by looking at their behavior. Um, and that's called siphoning while they're when they're swimming along and just sticking their bill into the water surface and they move the bill back and forth and they make this noise as they're forcing water through their bill. Other ducks do that as well. So of course, um, behavior is not a field mark, but it can give you a clue as to a bird's identity and then you can check the field marks. So if you see birds continuously, basically unendingly, swimming along with their faces in the water, siphoning like that, it might be a good clue that you got a, a shoveler. Um, but otherwise, you could see the on the bird on the right over here, uh, big old spatulate bill. None of our other uh, ducks we're talking about have a bill like that. A lot of orange on it. Males have a pale iris, um, it's usually orangish uh, to red. Um, that's also a good clue for for them, but uh, low riders moving along, um, pretty easy to identify once you um, get a good feel for how big that bill is. Okay, the biggest challenge. I intentionally put males in their snazzy plumage for this because how in the world could this be the biggest challenge? You've got the cinnamon teal on the left, blue wing teal on the right. That is impossibly easy. Cinnamon teal are, well, cinnamon in color. And blue wing teals, well, they've got that nice big white facial crescent and nothing really looks like them. Although I will say plenty of people misidentify immature scop as a uh, blue wing teal, but that's a different uh, story. So why is this a big challenge? Uh, it's a big challenge because when they get into their summer plumages, they pretty much look identical. Um, they are essentially the same size and shape. There is some subtle variation in bill size, but if you look at the measurements in the literature, they overlap extensively. So there, uh, it's a case where if you get extremes of one or the other, um, you can probably get the identifications correct on that, but most birds aren't extreme. Um, it's sort of, I would make an analogy with maybe long build and short build dowager where the bill sizes on those things overlap a lot. But if you get a really long build, long build dowager, you pretty much know exactly what you've got. So, uh, cinnamon teal bills, if they're extreme, they tend to be long on the longer and more spatulate side. In blueing teals, if they're extreme, they tend to be shorter and less spatulate, more blue, uh, more green wing teal like, um, but not quite to to that extreme. But the blue wings would be the more likely one to be very short, and the cinnamon teal would be the more likely one to be very long. But most birds are not extreme, and so there's a lot of overlap in the bill characteristics. So using that as a field mark is is a risky proposition. There's also subtle variation in body color for these. Um, you'll hear me say here in a minute that uh, cinnamon teal tend to look a little bit more ruddy colored in their summer, summer plumages and blueing teals tend to look a little grayer. That's a tendency, that's not an absolute and the colors overlap a lot. Um, in fact, so much that that's also very difficult to, to judge. And the lighting, if you see a bird in the morning, it can look with direct um, morning light it can really throw off your perception of what color the bird really is. Uh, same with the middle of the day when you've got really intense direct light, it can it can be difficult to judge what the color is. And some people are just not good at judging color. So mm -hmm. if you're aware you're one of those people, then be be really careful about making an ID based on this bird looks grayer or this bird looks uh, redder. That's tough. You often will hear about variation in face pattern. I'll say that there's a ton of overlap in that, but I'm going to show you some slides that'll show some tendencies to look for. 
And then finally, to throw a really nasty, unfortunate wrench into the whole thing, the two hybridize a lot. And so there are some of these brown teal that you're sure are either a blue winged or a cinnamon, but actually you might be more correct to say it could be a hybrid. So if you eBird these sorts of things, the best option is to say blue winged slash cinnamon teal and just move on um, and not worry too much about obsessing over getting it down to species level because it could be a hybrid, uh, could be a back cross, could be all kinds of other uh, derivative forms of some parental um, ancestry that we'll just never know. So let's look at some of the cinnamon teal tendencies. Um, they're actually really beautiful birds in eclipse plumage. Um, males are, they're really striking. Um, they tend to have no eye line. And so the eye line is the, the dark line that goes through the eye. Again, this is a tendency because some individuals will have it and others will be as plain faced as, um, almost as plain faced as a pintail. Um, the eye arcs were, are buffy. And so um, eye arc is basically a broken eye ring. So if these feathers around this eye were completely pale all the way around the eye, we would call it an eye ring. But because there's a little bit of a dark patch of feathers on the eye line, that line that runs through the eye, and it breaks that eye ring up, we call these eye arcs. So these tend to be buffier or browner in color in cinnamon teal um, and a little paler in blue wing. Um, the overall plumage color on cinnamon teal tends to be more reddish brown or ruddy colored. Um, it's Again, it's really variable. If you saw one that was just obviously super gray and completely lacking brown tones, you might be leaning more strongly towards blue wing teal because it's very unusual to see a really gray cinnamon teal in eclipse plumage, but um, it's not uncommon to see a pretty brown blue wing. So there's a lot of overlap in that. An interesting mark that I'd like to see more data on is that um, I've read in a couple of places that the bill down here at the base on cinnamon teal is usually not entirely black. I don't think this is the best picture to show uh, what's going on with the coloration here because there's some light reflecting off of this bill um, that's kind of at an odd angle and making the whole thing look much paler than they normally do. But um, I've read and have tried to examine this in the field, I'm looking at teal where I live, and it seems to hold up that there's a greenish or a pale area at the base of the bill on cinnamon teals, and it's not present on blue wings, at least not that I've been able to, to see yet. Um, the other thing is in the summer plumage of male cinnamon teals, summer plumage, the, um, the fancy plumage, the, the I'm attracting mates now plumage, trying to avoid the all the, the particular terminology that gets used on these things to, to keep it more accessible. Um, but in that plumage where the, the male teal is all reddish colored, his bright red eye is really obvious. That's a really neat part of their, their whole uh, color. Um, and that can still be uh, obvious in their eclipse plumage where it's reddish um, or orangish. So and it's a little hard to see in this picture, but that's definitely got a bright iris on that bird. So eye arcs, buffy, reddish brown body bill with a little bit of pale at the base um, of it on the on the edges so on the cutting edges down there um, pretty plain faced little to no eye line and if you can see the eye um, it's usually brightly colored here's some other examples um, of cinnamon teal you can see this one's um, molting probably into um, so this probably um, uh, probably about November, I think, for this bird. Uh, you can see some hints that um, it's got some of the bright ruddy patches. But here's another one where it looks very brown overall. It doesn't give you any idea at all that it it's gray. Uh, it's hard to see the head here. There's a little hint of a, a dark line on there, but uh, pretty spatulate bill. And then on the right over here, you see a little bit better what I was talking about with the pale on the edge of at the base of the bill. So it's a 
It's a, a subtle mark and you've got to be right on top of a bird to, to see that color at the base of the bill. It's not something that's going to be obvious if you're looking at ducks through a scope uh, 100 plus yards away. Okay, blue winged teal. Again, tendencies. Uh, they tend to have a stronger eye line um, and a, a darker cap. And so the supercilium, the this pale area between the dark line that goes through the eye, the eye line and the cap, is obviously contrasting more. It makes the overall look of the face look like it's got more pattern or structure to it than on most um, male cinnamon teals in the summer. They tend to have those eye arcs being a little bit paler. I would say this one's kind of uh, on the dark end of the spectrum. They sometimes can be almost white. Um, in the West, I think they rarely get to as white as they do in populations that are in the Midwest that I've seen. Um, but the eye arcs are definitely more contrasty and, and they stand out more. Perhaps it's just because they've got that dark eye line um, that stands out more and it, it adds to the visual contrast that you make out um, when you're looking at the birds. Um, they tend to have grayer brown body tones, so not as ruddy brown. Um, that's, again, a tendency, tons of overlap in that. They tend also to have this laurel area right here that's pale and not streaked like the rest of the face. That varies a lot in size. Uh, some cinnamon teal have that as well. And so you have to be really careful about using that mark alone. And the bill tends to be all dark. On average, some people say that blue winged teal have a less spatulate bill. But again, when I've looked at the numbers from measurements on these, they overlap a lot with cinnamon teal. Uh, but many of them, if you see multiple of these features that we've talked about, and it looks like the bill's pretty sm small and, and not as spatulate as you're seeing on, for example, adjacent cinnamon teal, um, then you might be able to feel like th that's giving you some information that helps you get to the right ID. Then the last thing I wanted to say is um, this actually looks more like a green wing teal than a cinnamon teal to me. It's overall, it's pretty small. It's got a dark bill. It's got that face structure. Um, it, it's got a, a dark brown plumage, but it's got dark undertail coverts. If it were a green wing teal, that pale area on the undertail coverts would stand out. Um, and they're a little bit longer. They're a low rider, so they're a little bit longer in body shape. Uh, but if you can't tell whether you've got a blue wing or a green wing, look at the undertail area. And if it's not pale, then uh, you might have a blue wing. So here's a little closer look at the eye arcs on blue wing teal. You see how they're a little bit wider and paler than on cinnamon teal. And that laurel patch and even the throat is often paler and unstreaked. Um, the main thing I want to leave you with on these is blue wing versus cinnamon teal is very hard ID and that you should never rely on a single field mark. If you wanna if you want to engage in the practice of doing your best to put the most likely correct name on a bird, then you wanna use multiple field marks for these things. You wanna find a, if you're looking for a blue winged teal in the West uh, in the summertime, you wanna find one that's got mostly dark bill. See, here's an example where maybe the lighting is making it look pale gray. It's definitely not greenish, um, but it's got a dark bill. It's got a dark line through the eye. It's got pale uh, eye arcs. It's got a pale oral area and it doesn't look reddish brown. It looks more grayish brown. So use all of the marks. And if you don't get to that point, then call it a slash and, and move on to the next bird. Okay, I said in the beginning, I wanted to remind you about sounds. Um, eBird is fantastic for this. All you got to do is go to explore species, type in the species name, and right on the front page, down in the, off to the right under the pictures, you're going to see this button that says listen. And that's where you can quickly learn all the different sounds of, of the ducks. And they are amazingly diverse. I mean, the standard quack that we all think of is pretty much a mallard. And then widgeons whistle, green winged teal whistle, blue winged teals have a little peepy -pee whistle sounds. Um, cinnamon teals have kind of a pitiful little quack. Um, and uh, what am I forgetting? Pintails often have this incredible sound that um, sounds like metallic. Um, I actually had uh, somebody who was birding in the fog here south of Corvallis one winter 
report a big flock of pine siskins go over. And it was a winter where we didn't have any siskins. And he was at one of our local marshes. And I wrote to him and I said, are you sure they weren't pintails? Because pintails can kind of give you the impression that they sound a little kind of, you know, metallic -y and like uh, crinkly plastic sound like, like siskins make. And uh, he logged on to eBird, listened to it, and he said, sure enough, they were definitely pintails. That makes a lot more sense based on where I was. So if you've got these brown ducks and you're like trying to figure out what the heck are they, but they're making noise, you can nail it down just by listening to the the sounds. They're they're pretty distinctive that way. So I think that's about all I wanted to, to cover and talk to you about. That's eight dabbling duck species. Um, a lot of the pictures are... are from public sources. Um, the wings are from the University of Puget Sound, which has an amazing uh, open wing collection of photos that you can log in, or you don't even have to log into, you just, just uh, navigate to the page and type in the species you're interested in, and it'll pull up all kinds of pictures of the open wings, and you can study those. Um, yeah, happy to answer any, any questions. I hope that uh, it makes looking at piles of brown ducks a little bit more fun now. <laughs> It, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you Thank very, you so very much. much. Great. Uh, for anyone who has a question, please pop it into the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. That helps us keep track of it. And uh, while people are doing that, Doug, I actually had a couple of uh, quick questions. Okay. Um, the speculum, um, that is year round on all ducks, correct? Correct. Yeah. It, uh, it Well, except for the few weeks when all those flight feathers are regrowing. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And summertime, they drop those, they drop the primaries and the secondaries, usually within one or two days, um, they're all gone. And so that would be the only time when you wouldn't see the, the secondary patch. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And females kind of go through that same eclipse plumage also where they lose flight ability for two or three weeks. They do. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. As soon as the kids are independent and uh, can basically take care of themselves, then mom's like, okay, it's time for me to take care of my body plumage and shift over to fresh feathers. And so she does that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, Great. and I, one last one. And on diving ducks, uh, they go through an eclipse plumage also. Do they, are they um, also flightless during that period? Yeah, pretty much all ducks will be, be flightless um, and geese. The, there's a few minor exceptions, but most of the time in terms of scheduling, like red, I mentioned ruddy ducks are a little bit weird. Um, they maintain flight through the summer. They also maintain their bright blue bill and their, their bright ruddy plumage. And one of the ideas about why that might be is that they are extremely promiscuous. And so they're basically looking for opportunities to meet with, to mate with anybody all summer long. Um, and they, they nest really late relative to other ducks. And so they've, they've got some reason to, to maintain their ability to move around. Um, and so they tend to drop their feathers very late in the fall after most of the other ducks have done it. Sometimes in some populations, if I'm remembering correctly, it's actually in the winter when they get to their wintering grounds, they'll molt. Yeah. Okay. Sea, sea ducks do it out at sea because they can, you know, they diving ducks have a great advantage because it's very easy for them and sea ducks to just go underwater if a predator comes by. It's right. it's the the attack from below that's the the worry <laughs> for them. <laughs> yeah, it won't help against a shark or a no, exactly. <laughs> so probably nothing would help against a shark. So you're. <laughs> so should I uh, stop sharing and, here? Um, you you can stop or keep. You could keep if you want, because okay. if somebody wants to go to a slide, maybe. But we have some questions in the Q and A, and because the people on the um, on the uh, uh, live stream can't see it, I'm I'm just going to read them. So, um, Alexander Andrew, asks. Yeah. Um, can you help with distinguishing female non-breeding Eurasian widgeons from flocks of American widgeons? Yeah, that's that's a good one. That's a that's a higher level question. So what I would be looking for um, is the head on Eurasian widgeons tends to be less black and white fine feather patterns and more reddish brown and white feather patterns. That would be the first thing that I would clue into. 
Um, and I think that's probably the most reliable thing. There's also differences in the colors of the underwing, but that doesn't help you much on birds that are just walking or swimming. Um, but that if I saw one that was really reddish headed instead of grayish, so black and white, really, you know, narrow markings from a distance look gray, that would be the main thing that I would key into. They also have different sounds. So if you can hear them, if you can hear them, you can identify them by their voice too. Uh, most, mm -hmm. most North American birders I've run into don't realize there's a difference, but look, check out yeah. e eBird in the Macaulay Library. It's a pretty distinctive difference in the whistle. Great, great. Thanks. And thanks, Alexander. Yeah. Um, another question. How are the molt patterns similar and different in Muscovy's wood and whistling ducks? Ah, interesting question. So I don't know much about the Muscovy's and the whistling ducks. I don't know if I read very much about that. The um, wood ducks have basically the same pattern. Um, they also drop their their flight feathers um, in the summertime and molt into an eclipse type plumage. I didn't include them here with the dabblers because their head markings are so distinctive that yeah, and yeah. the color right is red and white even in their in their summer plumage. And so um, I feel like most people can get a look at the the body of a wood duck and say, that's got to be a wood duck. It can't be anything else. Um, immature females, that's a different question that uh, sometimes that uh, causes people to pause a bit. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that Muscovies or the whistling ducks are different. I think they're probably the same, but I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Sounds Thank good. Thank you. Um, any other well, questions put them in the q a um yeah it's uh thank you very much doug it's like um you realize once you get into a subject just how in depth you can get and how many things i often would pass over it kind of remind me of that old ken kaufman story when he did um when he did his big year when he was 17 or 18 or whatever, he found lots and lots of gulls, but of course they were all adult males. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we forget just how, um, you know, I, I remember my, the first uh, teal lesson I had was how do you recognize a female cinnamon teal? You look for the, it's sitting next to the male cinnamon teal, you know, type. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's a good clue, but not in the summertime. You get you go from you go from half the world being uh dull brown ducks to the entire world, well the northern hemisphere anyway, being dull brown ducks in the summertime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, here we go. Oh, we have another question. Um, how do you recognize hybrids in the summer? <laughs> uh, not sure hybrids of what though. Yeah, it's it, <laughs> Exactly. It depends on the hybrid. Uh, if you've got hybrid cinnamon teal, blue wing teal, good luck. I have no <laughs> clue that anybody's ever worked out how to do that. Uh, if they have, I would like them to verify it genetically to prove to us that they've worked it out because yeah. that is really, really hard. Um, if if it's a male hybrid and it's in its plumage that it displays in the winter, it's pretty easy. Um there's some variations on on what those look like, but they're they're pretty obvious. But boy, eclipse plumage, I just don't think you could do it. Um, we do have a, a interesting female. I think it's a female, not a hybrid male. Uh, hmm. Pintail by Mallard here that's hanging out that's been photographed. You could you could check oh. that out on eBird because most of the time birds that are ducks that are reported as hybrids in the wild are males and so finding a female hybrid is really unusual um, but the ebird for benton county has some pictures over the, i think this bird's been around for about three years on and off usually comes around in the summertime um, that's an interesting bird to look at because you can see sort of a combination of the pintail body shape and features and, and mallard uh, feather characteristics but yeah, to totally depends on the hybrid. And if you get into 
learning how to identify hybrid ducts, more power to you. It's a great puzzle, but it's also a <laughs> very difficult one to be sure you're right about. <laughs> well, you know, that, that, raised, that raises an interesting question because obviously, Mall well, not, I, I'm saying obviously, but it seems mallards are much more, um, well, hybridized much more easily than something that is really wild like a pintail. Um, is there a pecking order? Like is mallard definitely followed by um, uh, followed by other ducks uh, or something yeah. more common to hybridize? I would say that the teal hybridize quite a lot. The blue winged and cinnamon teal hybridize. Shovelers hybridize with the teal quite a bit. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but you're right that many of the hybrids we see are uh, have some mallard genes in there. Yeah. Um, and less often do you see, I'm trying to think of what I what I would have seen or read about as being really rarely involved in hybrids. It's usually somebody in a different genus, like wood ducks don't yeah. hybridize with the other the other dabblers yeah. quite as uh, often. That's really, really unusual. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of hybridization from divers to dabblers. Sure. Uh, so, sure. so anise versus athea, that doesn't happen all that much. Um, but yeah, ma mallards, um, if you've watched mallards during breeding season, you know, mallards, <laughs> they'll do it with just about anybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they've come up to many a hiking shoe and try to, <laughs> yeah. Make, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we often talk about Frank and mallards as we're out birding. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see why. Yeah. Cause they'll go with the, any domestic park goose that they run or, duck across <laughs> maybe even a goose but they they might get their butts kicked if they tried it with the goose <laughs> <laughs> well it looks like uh we're pretty much slowing down questions but an awful lot of thank yous doug it was a wonderful program tonight thank you very very much thank you so much great yeah, thank my, you very my much pleasure. my pleasure i hope ducks are a little bit more fun in the summer now <laughs> yeah a Absolutely. lot more a lot more chance of identifying them <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, join, please join us for our next webinar. It'll be coming out uh, uh, for next month. And until then, thank you all very much. Um, we'll see you all. Oh, okay. we'll see you all. We'll see you all next time. And okay. thanks again, Doug. We really yeah, appreciate you. You're welcome. You. My pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. <laughs> Take care, Bye. everyone. Good night. <laughs>